Talk a bit about LXC containers, what they are, what I found out about them, but not diving deeply into them. You might want to go away and play with them yourself um, after this, or you might just go, oh, I'm aware of that, and uh, I'll go and watch YouTube kittens instead. Um, so we've, there's a bit of background is that <coughs> We've used them here successfully for um, various virtual machines. Um, we've had various project-related virtual machines in the past. Um, so there are, very, there are different virtualization techniques. The ones that we've used in the past here is just uh, KVM to set up virtual machines, where you've got full machine emulated. We've um, also used um, VirtualBox um, and VMware. Um, and they're a complete emulation of a hardware machine um, and so the, the operating system sat inside unless it's going out of its way to care doesn't care because it can talk to the disk it can talk to uh, the network um, and none of it's real but it doesn't know um, they've got performance problems with that um, and so you can get para-virtualization para where the illusion is not quite as complete. Um, so at one level you can have just the device drivers that are para-virtualized. And so we tend to use that quite a lot so that for talking to the hard disk, rather than talking to something that pretends to be a SATA disk controller, it's actually a... Um, piece of software that goes off and knows how to talk to the host to, to deliver the data and has a lower overhead. Um, and, but you can go and have a completely para-virtualized OS and that's the approach that um, Zen uses. Um, where LXC fits is um, operating system level virtualization. So you've not virtualized and simulated a whole machine, you've just simulated a particular environment. So then you've got processes running in the host operating system, but they have their own particular view of the uh, file system, of the network, and of the memory. Um, and that has a lower overhead. Um, and allows you to make more of your resources. Um, the Linux containers are actually built using Linux control groups um, and so there are two aspects to it. One is limiting the amount of resources that you get, so how much memory and how much CPU do you get, because you put it onto this big stonking server with 40,000 cores uh, and 16 trillion gigabytes of memory, but what you want to do is just give it a portion of that and it can then use those resources. Um, the bit that makes the containers useful is the namespacing. Um, so, uh, you probably if you've come across Unix, you've got Chirut, which was uh, a facility that's been around since the dawn of time, you chew root to a directory, and then you can't get out. That's the root of your file system, so you change the root. So you're, you're namespacing the file system. Containers is taking it uh, much further. You have the namespace, the process IDs, um, network interfaces, um, the, the mount, which the file system points, into process communication so that it's only processes within the container that talk to each other. Um, and the other one on the list is the host name. So it has its own idea of what the host name is. So it looks like an operating system inside a container, but it isn't. So the, the main advantages of the lower overhead. Um, a traditional fully emulated virtual machine has a kernel running in there to manage the resources of that operating system. Um, you ha end up with a block of memory allocated to that um, operating system. 
as a whole. And there are tricks where you have a special device driver that steals memory away from the guest and gives it back to the host so that the host can use it somewhere else and so that you can um, limit the memory usage going on. But it's, it's, not, it's not ideal and what I think you tend to do is just go, well, I've got a two gigabyte machine here, two gigabyte machine here, two gigabyte machine here, uh, so that's my eight gigabyte host full because I've got some for the for itself. Um, an example of the overhead that you get with uh, a KVM style thing can be demonstrated by looking at the networking. So this is a, a KVM style machine. You've got the virtual machine running there. You've got the QE, QEMU, which is the user process and the host that's uh, managing the interaction between the host and the guest. And the network packet comes in on the real network adapter, goes through a bridge, goes through the tap interface, gets picked up in user space, gets shoved across into the virtual uh, machine. Um, you can optimize that um, by using a component called vhost and that in the kernel bypasses going through user space and shoves it straight into the um, virtual machine. And this graph is um, showing the differences in latency you get between those, between the native host, which is the blue, and as the message size goes up, the latency goes up. That's the yellow line at the top is the um, standard out-of-the-box network latency. Um, and that's even with using the uh, para-virtualized network device driver. It's probably much worse if you start to, I've got a network uh, that's emulating uh, an old uh, 10 meg network card, an RTL 8139. Um, but by bypassing user space, I do get it down, but it's, it's not as fast as um, the host uh, latency, so you've got a penalty there. And for a project um, at LMAX, where they cared about latency deeply because of the trading, um, they were running their machines on bare hardware because they couldn't take the penalty of the virtualization. Other, aspect, other areas they had virtualized for convenience, but the key components were running on bare, bare metal, but they were looking at using containers to get the advantage of the virtualization, but without the network overhead. Uh, and that's just one aspect. The same goes for disk I.O. Um, the, the other thing is that it's a process running in the um, host operating system. So it's just using the resources there. If it's not running, it's not using any resources. Um, the, there are tools for managing LXCs, for creating them, starting them, stopping them. Um, so I think if you install the package LXC utils, you can do it that way. Um, I've not actually looked at it, it looked like hard work. Um, but the virtual machine manager that you'll find on a standard Debian Ubuntu install will actually be able to manage LXC containers. Um, and actually I say Debian, um, I haven't actually got my, it working on mine. Um, but the experimentation that I've been doing and where we've got them running um, over the corridor have been using Ubuntu 12.04. So the virtual machine manager uh, configure it, you specify the hypervisor as LXC, um, and you can use the command line, you can use the GUI for starting and stopping and controlling things. Um, command line, you specify the, uh, the config URL of LXC, um, and that in the same way that you can manage local uh, KVMs or remote KVMs, you can also do the same with remote.
and LXCs. Um, there are two container, two container types you can specify. Uh, one is an application container, where you just say, this application I want you to run, I want you to allocate this much memory and um, CPU to it. Um, but it doesn't allow you to give the file system and you would have to do the configuration of the network adapter in some other way. So for the cases I'm interested in, that's not an interesting thing. It's, it's building a whole operating system container. Uh, the downside, I think, with using LXC over just creating um, a KVM is that you've got to do some manual work. It's got to be done from the command line. Um, so, before you go in and create your container in Virtual Machine Manager, you've got to create a file system for it to, to run in. So, um, the, I'll just go, I create a partition, an LVM partition, um, create a file system on it, and I mount it. So that's the first bit. I've now got an empty file system that I can populate. And I probably want to make it so that it was persistently mounted on the next reboot by putting in etc. FS tab. But it's always much funnier if you reboot the machine and things don't work. Um, a feature of Debian and related um, installers is that there is a dev bootstrap command which you can say, go away, create me the, an installed operating system tree in this destination. Um, the, so it's basically the dev bootstrap, specify a release and a place to put it in. The other bits I specified is that I want to have main and universe because I'm expecting to have to install packages from universe. Um, I can specify the, server, the extra packages I want to include. It doesn't include an SSH server by default, so I do that. If I know exactly what it is that I want up front, I can say I want uh, OpenJDK, Maven, Ant, uh, C++ compiler, um, all of those fun things. I can, I can do that there, or I can go and install them later as I would with any other install. Um, the only annoying thing is that the directory you put it in has to be empty, oh sorry, non-existent, um, so I can't actually put it directly into my um, newly created and mounted partition because it goes, oh, it's not empty. So I end up doing the, put it into a target directory and then moving it into the right place. Sorry, Nick, and the swap space, would you create it in the file system later on in Agitate? The, no, so the, the probably didn't make that clear. The, you're not having to allocate swap space to the containers because it's just a process in the, in the host. So the host has got to have enough swap for everything. Okay. So if you were setting up a virtualization host with KVM, um, ideally you wouldn't have any swap. Um, because if you're starting to swap out your VM images, it's going to hurt. But these are just processes. They may be idle. Um, and so that's not quite as bad. Nick, you talked about um, Debian and Ubuntu pretty exclusively. Are they installing LVM by default these days? Because we're setting up multiple volumes there. Uh, Volume groups, which is suggest you're using LVM. I am using uh, <coughs> LVM. That might be because whenever I do an install, I specify LVM, so I've got it in there. I'm fairly sure a server installed Ubuntu mm -hmm. by LVM. I don't know about yeah. Most of the hat versions, they use LVM by default. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, but it's, it, it might be that you've got to install a couple of extra dependent packages. And you have reminded me, the thing I was going to say right at the beginning was, if you've got any questions, uh, speak out. Um, the only thing with Dead Preach Trap is that it splats in a file system image of the install, but it hasn't done any configuration. And uh, I painfully discovered that you can't just fire it up and have it work. Um, so 
this is a bit where you can use Churut to actually Churut into the file system. You're now, you've only just namespaced your file system view. So you're still the host, but nothing else is going on. Um, but you can configure the file system. It's the easiest way to do things in there. Um, the only thing is, is that the prompt tells you what your working directory is and what the host name is. And your host name is your uh, virtualization host. And the directory is the directory inside that true root. So it'll say you're in slash etc. So you go, that's OK. I can just trash etc. password and delete it all. And then you think, ah, oh, I'm in the wrong window. <laughs> Be careful. Um, once you're in there, you can configure the host name, um, generate locales, and set that as the default, because otherwise you get all sorts of locale-related errors. Um, configure a time zone. Uh, Europe, London happens to be my favourite. Um, there are other people in the room that will just go, it's wrong. So you could just leave it as UTC. Um, the default installation installs NTP date, so that when your network comes up, it will try and set the time using NTP date. It's going to be inside a container. It can't do that. It's wasting its time. Uh, I can't remember if it generates errors and breaks things or whether it's just wasting its time. Just remove it. And you have to remove the Ubuntu minimal package because that's what's installed and it says you must have NTP date. Um, and you need to tell it about the network interface that it's going to have, the F0. Um, I was going to say, and that's it. Um, apart from that, you, what you want to do is add a user so that you can actually log in. Because unlike your standard install of your ISO, it hasn't prompted you for a user to um, uh, log in as. It hasn't set a password for the root account. And you can end up with a container that's very pretty, but you can't log into, not even through the console. Um, although, one of the things that I found is quite useful is you've got this pretty container that is non-functioning because you've got to configure the network or you can't log in because you didn't create the users. You can go back and you can go and do the true root from the host and go and manipulate things there. Um, you can do quite a lot of the adding packages and things from there if it's just dropping things into the file system. If it starts needing to talk over to the network, uh, to other things, or operate in a mode that should be done on a running system rather than a, a flat packed one, then you want to do it from the running container. So now you can go back to Virtual Machine Manager, create the configuration. Um, for operator system container, tell it where the root directory is, the one that you just created, how much memory, how much CPU you want to create, and then start it. Um, to stop the container, uh, you want to use destroy and not shut down. Um, if you try and use shut down from the virtual machine manager, at least in 12.04, I haven't tried a more recent version, it says not implemented. Um, if you um, if you're inside the running container, if you've SSH into it and do shutdown, uh, that brings the processes down. Uh, but Chris ran into a problem. Oh no, Chris worked out what the problem was that I'd run into. Um, is that it, uh, the last thing it does in the shutdown is mounts the file system read only, um, which is very very subtle because when you start it up, it just fails to start up. Um, so destroy is a bit violent. It's like flicking off the power switch on the, the operating system. But you don't have to run about, worry about corrupting the file system because the file system's in the host. So this is, I've started up the container and I've SSH'd into it. So you can see there's SSH processes. And I've just done list all the processes. Uh, so, this is the fairly standard minimal 
uh, Linux installation running. I've got in it as PID1. Uh, I've got the process that's um, doing DHCP on the network interface. Um, Uh, yeah, and there are some uh, getties, uh, which are the thing that's giving the login prompt on the um, virtual terminals. And if you use Virtual Machine Manager to connect to the console, it's one of those that you'll be logged in into. Um, you do get a very strange effect where if you use the Virtual Machine Manager console because you've got a terminal where it doesn't really know what the dimensions of the screen are so you, it's giving you a bit of real estate like that but it's really 25 by 80 there and scrolling and things don't work very well so you're much better to actually SSH in and get a first class experience so that's what it looks inside the container if I do the, a PS from the host from outside the container I see all of the same processes. Um, the one at the top is the a process that's actually used to start the container. Um, and you see there in it has a process ID of 12516. Um, so it's completely different namespace. Um, but the all of the values will be unique outside the host and inside they'll be different and unique and inside the container in it is PID1 which it has to be so that everything gets inherited by it and, and it all works. So it is quite useful if I want to see what's going on inside the containers I see what processes are running. I don't have to log into each one individually and have a look at it. I can just go to the host and have a look at them. The whole lot. Presumably, you, you can kill processes from outside as well. Yes. Right. Yeah. But they might go. Oh, where did that come from? <laughs> but I don't think. I think that's probably is. Um, Anthropomorphic fighting a little bit too much. <laughs> um, the containers aren't perfect, and this is one of the things that. Um, I've come across. So if I go log into the container and run top, um, the it tells me that I've got 22 tasks running, one of which is running, 21 is hidden. That sounds consistent with the process view that you saw inside the container. The it says it's been up for 297 days. Um, it hasn't actually. The um, I think I cheated. I've logged into. Uh, machine in the machine room, but I'm fairly certain it hasn't been up 297 days. The host may have been. Um, but if I say, show me what all of the CPUs are doing, it says that there are up to 23 of them. Well, sorry, 24. Um, because that's how many the host has got. And that's not how many have been allocated to the container. Um, and likewise, the memory there, it says that there's 64 gigabytes of memory available. No, the container doesn't have that much. It's only got a few. So this has caused problems when we've been running Java because it uses the number of CPUs and the number and the amount of memory for the defaults for the heap size. Um, if you've got uh, some of the garbage collection um, algorithms, have the number of threads used to run the garbage collection based upon the number of threads available. So these are all things that, in the case of Java, you can actually configure it and say, no, your maximum heap size is two gigabytes. The number of threads that you can use for doing this is that many. Um, but if you don't, you can get some strange effects. And I think we had um, a Java process that went, oh, I can have 
32 gigabytes a heap and would just grow and grow. There was no pressure to garbage collect, it just grew until the operating system, I think, then kicked in and went, but uh, you can't have that and failed. Why is that not contained? I don't know. <coughs> it wasn't it's a clear. It's virtualized file system. It can run off slash proc, isn't it? It's coming off proc, but proc could lie. Um, I mean, the, all of the process stuff comes from slash proc. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether it's... But there could be some elements that actually s go straight back to the host. Yeah, so it might, it, I don't know whether it's a deliberate design decision or whether it's a, oh, we haven't got around to doing that yet. Um, one of the aspects that uh, with LXC is that they're, they're all separate processes. Um, if I've got a KVM um, set of guests, um, I've installed the same version of the operating system in all 20 of them. So they've all got identical copies of the kernel, of libc, of the JVM, of Apache. And, and there's a um, module called KSM that will trawl the um, memory um, and go, these are actually the same page, the same contents, they're the same, they're both uh, write only, read only, they're both read only, so I can just use the same page for everything. Um, and the uh, KVM will mark those pages as, as, as candidates for being checked to see whether they are shareable, and it will share them. So it reduces the overhead you've got of running 10 different, 10 identical copies of libc. Mm. Um, with LXC, it doesn't do that. You, you've got, I've, I've used that dev bootstrap and I've installed 10 identical copies. I've now got 10 copies of, L, of libc in memory. Um, so, the, you, you've lost that sharing. Um, what you can do is, um, what I've done here is um, regained that by sharing uh, binary content between different virtual machines. Um, so I've set up a base image that is uh, the reference copy the one that's installed and then I have uh, copies of the root file system and for our Jellybox containers um, the bit that gets written is just that server traffic era so each container has its own copy of that but the bin directories, the lib directories uh, so user, that would be user bin and user s bin um, the gems, the Jellybox directory itself um, are all um, shared so there is only one copy of libc for all 10 containers to run um, except for alternatives is on there just because it makes the management easy because i go oh i don't want to use that version of the jvm i want to use that version and if i don't have a copy of except for alternatives i've got to go and do update that all machines um, it's a bit clunky and a bit hard coded so I think I've got a, a shell script that creates, does a sync of the right bits to do it, so that I don't have to remember all of the bits myself. So what, okay. what methods are we using for sharing? Just links? Oh, next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. <coughs> I'm glad you asked that. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I was just thinking, I haven't said, oh yes I have. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, so the um, virtual machine manager has XML files that, that define what they call the domain. And so the, the first one is the root file system where I'm saying that the source directory is um, that site JWAS1 and I want that to appear as slash in the file system. And then I say that um, the accept alternatives comes from that shared directory, the, the JWAS base. 
and it has the read-only tag in it. The <coughs> um, Virtual Machine Manager allows you to define file systems and add them, but not specify that they're read-only. So um, I've gone in and I've done that by hand. Um, that's just, um, you can do Vshow edit and the um, domain file. You can always use the GUI and set it up. Or you can look to see if in the current LTS, which is now a year and a half later, whether they've actually added support for it. Um, so there are incidental benefits that I've come across with LXC. Um, the, it's an LVM partition. It's on the host machine. Um, the Linux kernel is able to grow an LVM partition and do online resizing of a mounted file system. So I can just grow the file system. It's not going to affect running processes either in the host or in the um, containers. So you can just do that without, without any downtime. Um, and a, another thing that has occurred to me is that um, we've got a file system we can access from the host. We can just rsync that across to copy it across um, to take a live snapshot. Um, whereas with a KVM I have an opaque disk and I have to copy every block. Um, rsync doesn't like talking to uh, disk devices, so you have to DD the whole lot um, each time. So you've got the ability to rsync to just go, right, copy it across. Um, so I'm thinking of taking advantage of that for um, our DHCP server. At the moment it's running on a on a host, if it were a container, um, and we had it copied across, when that machine's power supply dies, a purely hypothetical um, <laughs> failure, um, we could then bring it up on the other end and carry on reading slash dot. Does that mean you can use the same approach for take, so you can move a, a, a containerized file system just with rsync and all tools? I mean, you could create a containerized file system from a physical, yeah, uh, uh, machine. If you're yes. wanting to virtualize it the same way. Yeah, yeah. So the I think the advantage of using Dev Bootstrap over uh, an existing file system is that um, our normal installs go. Oh well, what you need is you need a graphical desktop, mm -hmm. and uh, you better have um, all of these other things, C C compiler um, things. Dev Bootstrap is quite good at giving a small cut down install. Yeah. But yeah, I think for you go, oh, I've got a KVM today, I want an LXC tomorrow, but yeah. I don't want to be able to build it from scratch. I think that's a, a perfectly good approach. What immediately occurred to me is if you've got a machine which is dying, yeah. but the disks are working, you can extract the disks and turn it into a container. Yeah. yeah. Or put in your power supply. Uh, sorry, Nick. Any devices that you have, I mean, you put an ETH in the, um, the network setting and somehow picked up some device of some sort to connect to the host's network. But what if you have some other device on the main host which you want to access to in the virtual machine? Is that going to be possible? Or, the, um, so I'm just thinking, that the, so the devices you have a networking disk, so those are already containerized, but if you had a random USB webcam plugged in, I'm not sure how they appear. Uh, I've not I've not thought about that. Um, so I don't because they. Yeah, think about the mouse or something like that. I don't know. I don't know if you can run X in one of these LXCs and what you mean. Um. Well, I guess you'd also need a display. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you haven't got a display. Yeah. Um, but... Or a printer or something. Having graphical 
uh, containers to some extent as possible. So the Raspberry Pi upstairs is uh, using VNC to connect to CRTV, um, which is just the browser view of the current uh, Jenkins build, and that's actually running on a container, but is a X11 VNC, so it's a virtual display. Um, so you, you're not limited to, oh, is, can I run things on the command line? You could provide a virtual display like X11 VNC and have that as its head. Um. So although LXC is wonderful, I think there are times when KVM may still be appropriate. Um, I think security it is the, the claim that LXC containers are vulnerable to a malicious root user. I don't think that they have containers have been uh, built to be a complete firewalled, sandboxed um, thing. I think uh, emulating the machine for a KVM is is better at doing that, there's less leakage out. Uh, I think with a container, if you actually get into the container, um, you can then get out and then wreak havoc across your other containers and your host. Um, clock adjustment. Um, I have the requirement that I want to be able to change the clock to be yesterday or tomorrow. You can't do that with containers because it's the clock of the host. Could change the host and change everything all at once. Um, but the, the, the thing about taking KVMs and LXCs is actually for uh, requirement to do the time dependent thing, I took the file system, copied it into a, um, a KVM, booted with an external kernel, and it all ran. Uh, without needing to, so I didn't have to go through the, oh, let's rebuild this from scratch. Um, if you've got other operating systems, you've got to use KVM. Um, and, or even if you want to run the same operating system Linux, but with a different kernel. Um, and I, I think I'd add, I'd add to that, if you've got things that are too aware of the environment that they're in. So I've talked about we could, you can go in and set all the parameters to get your JVM running as you want. Could you do that for Oracle? Maybe. Um, but maybe you go, no, I'm not going to bother. Um, and I think the other reason is ease of guest configuration. Um, it's quite easy with using the GUI to say, here's an ISO, go and create me a virtual machine with a graphical desktop. Interesting with the Oracle one, because uh, it would be more of a licensing uh, issue, because uh, if, they, if it's aware of the full CPUs of the host, it's, uh, the licensing terms would be, that's what you have to pay for, rather than just what you're providing <coughs> in, the, uh, in the container. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, when I... Uh, said I was going to do this talk, I uh, had a couple of interesting um, things that were pointed out to me. Uh, I believe it was Kieran that forwarded me a link on Etsy. Uh, uh, 14,000 tests per day and counting, I think, was the headline. Um, and so they've used um, LXC for their um, CI um, environment because They've got a very resource-heavy uh, component test run, test run, and so having something with a minimal amount of overhead was important to them. Um, and so this is actually ripped straight off of their um, uh, blog article. Um, so they've got homogenized workload, so they've got complete control over what the platform is. They're not having to do it across a range of platforms. Um, they needed to be conscious about the resources, and they could. They, they, so there's the thing: we cons instead of concerning ourselves with process opening, RAM provisioning, disk imaging, um, and doing all of the tweaking that could make have made KVM work for them, they went, "Don't care. We'll just use LXC." Um, 
and did it that way. Um, they also said that they did things like they'd have um, one executor per one LXC because that gave them um, benefits with Jenkins, but I think that was more about Jenkins rather than LXC. Um, but for them, that, that really worked, and their build pipeline has the ability for a developer to not actually make a commit, just go, oh, I've got some random stuff on my machine. Does it work? And they ship it off. Um, so the, it's, if you search for Coders Craft, the two blog posts, the first one talks about the, using LXC, and the second one is more about their um, infrastructure that they had for provisioning these things to, to make it easy. Because you don't want to have to go, oh, I need something a bit like this. Where's Nick's script? Uh, what does it do? I'll ask him. Oh, he doesn't know either. Um, and the other thing, interesting thing that was mentioned was Docker. Um, so it, I know very little about it apart from the, the um, uh, logo is quite nice. And, but Chris spoke about it and said that it uses Union um, file system. So a Union file system, you have a, a this sort of master copy, and then the Union file system records the changes on top of it. And that sounded quite a, a appealing approach to doing what I've done manually by r syncing and doing the, oh, we'll have that bit and that bit, oh, and that bit over there as read-only. If you haven't changed it, it will come from the underlying file system and will be shared. If you have changed it, it will be come from the union file mm -hmm. system and won't be shared. So Docker seemed to be talking about running individual applications, but um, having the union file system for dealing with this um, sharing of content seemed very interesting. And it might actually be more appropriate for some use cases. I think uh, if you had uh, lots of isolated application servers you wanted to run, then it would be ideal because you tell right, I want 10 application servers. Um, for our, um, our JBoss instances, it's more that we need an operating system because its operation is you use SSH to copy stuff in, you use SSH to start things up, and then you run JBoss. So it's not just the application server, it's a broader thing that we're having to emulate here. Yeah, I think Docker's focus is kind of a sort of, it's an appliancey approach to doing things. So you define a Docker container that will do just one thing. It will run a Tomcat server, or it will run a mail server, or it will run a, some other kind of server. Um, and it doesn't have states, it doesn't uh, run a database or anything like that. You, uh, you can define it in terms of what's already been defined. So a Tomcat server is just a Linux server plus Java. Or a Tomcat server is a Java server plus the Tomcat binaries, and a Java server is a Linux server plus the Java package. Um, so you just stack things up on top of each other to define yeah. the appliance that you want, and then you can just run as many instances of it as you like. Yes, yeah, so, so that if the uh, definition of an appliance is uh, more than just an application, if it's more of the sort of operating system mm -hmm. and more of an environment, then yeah, that would be yeah. fine because it's it will be a Linux server with an SSH server and a JBoss installation. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think Does the like composition work by inheritance or aggregation. Um, Inheritance, I guess, you are um, overlaying bits of file system on top of each other. But the for the SSH server and the JBoss server, the, there is no common yeah, ancestor, no there. so oh. you'd end up with the I'm going to create a yeah, super, super, super class. Yeah, I don't. So this is just this was a something that sounded interesting because. Um, LXC as a technology is, is wonderful, but it's the management um, that will make it more useful. Um, 
the what I forgot to say in the Etsy example is that they were using Chef to to bring it up, and it sounded like that they weren't too concerned about sort of wastage on a shared VM basis. They were just happy that there was less overhead. Okay. Any Sorry, you know when you first specify the memory and the CPU, uh, what is the interpretation of that? Is that you sort of saying, I have physical 8 gigabytes, I must not allocate more than that to any of my LXC containers that must be? So the, the LXC container, um, the memory that you're spe so LXC has a fine-grained um, allocation of memory and swap. <coughs> So you can say, well, you can have um, two gigabytes of main memory, but, and I'll let you have a gigabyte of swap. And I think at that point, it's the same as the host operating system, <coughs> that you'll get to the point where I go, no, I'm full. Um, so the virtual machine manager interface doesn't let you specify that. It just allows you to specify the amount of memory that is memory and swap. So you've, by choosing an easier, a management tool, you've lost some of the control. And the total manager has the host swap by CPU too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is the CPU's cores? I think it's cores, yes. Right. Yeah. Um, the, although I did a quick test and I wasn't completely convinced that um, it was limiting itself to the things that I allocated to it. might all be a shame. It may, so I know that with Solaris zones, um, you can resource limit like that, but the default behavior is that unless resources are constrained, it won't apply the limits. Uh, when stuff starts getting busy, mm -hmm. then it will throttle back your usage of cores in particular. It will let you spread onto as many cores as you've got, so long as none of the other um, uh, zones are busy. Yeah. But when all the other zones start working hard, then the kernel will then go and look up on its table and say, right, okay, so you're only allowed to have two cores and you can have four. Yeah. And the, yes, Linux containers is not revolutionary or new in any way. Um, Solaris containers, uh, Linux has got OpenVZ, uh, LibVserver, or uh, V, something like that, and Solaris. IAX has got something. What's the um, support and community thing uh, like around containers? I mean, you said you had to you know, figure out a few things yourself along the way, but is, it, is there enough information out there that's easy enough to pick up? Or? Yeah, so a lot of these things are, um, I've found, easily found by searching for things. Uh, so it's, it's not somebody's bright idea that's festering in a corner yeah. somewhere. Uh, so I would especially since it, it has been picked up by the Virtual Machine Manager and is one of the two default options with an Ubuntu server mm -hmm. installed, I think that the tools will get better. Um, but I thought I wouldn't jeopardise this talk by going, oh, there's a new LCS come out, I'll just upgrade it. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.